Before we get started, it's important to understand how applications typically used to handle authentication. When we talk about traditional web applications, you can think of an application that runs on PHP. For each page, it would do a request to the server and it would apply any business logic, access a database if needed, and then return a full HTML page. This differs from modern applications where we have a heavy JavaScript front-end that only fetches the necessary data from the server. That would be the case in a React.js application. So how would authentication work on one of those PHP servers? As a first step, our browser would make a GET request to the login endpoint. The server would accept the request and serve back a login form. The user would then fill the form with his credentials and send it back to the server through a POST request. The server will take this data, validate it against the database, and retrieve the necessary user information. Finally, it will send back the home page to the user. But now in order to validate that the user is indeed authenticated on future requests, the server also sends a, a cookie to the browser. That cookie is passed along with each future request and the server can know the state of the user by finding a local session with a matching ID. This model worked very well in the past, but has to change with modern single page applications. In these applications, we use a third party server for our data. So why not use another server for our authentication too? OAuth was built to help you delegate authentication to a third party server and we will see how to leverage that during this course. There are many reasons why traditional authentications don't work well with single page applications. First of all, cookies don't work well in a course environment. Chances are that you're trying to access data from a different server and maybe One even multiple APIs on different servers. For you from another cookies API, will give you a hard your time cookies won't follow, so it, it's completely useless. Finally, if you have a REST server, it should be stateless. By keeping a session open, you have a state then you need to ensure that all of your servers share the same state, which can be tricky. So with modern applications, we need another solution. This is where OAuth comes into play. With OAuth, you will have an authorization server that will give you tokens that can easily be passed around. This solves our problem and comes with a nice side effect. You can delegate your authorization to a third-party server. In our case, we will be using Auth0 for this. So when looking at OAuth, there are different actors involved in the process. First of all, you have your client. Your client is typically your browser trying to access a resource, but could be a mobile device, could be your a smartwatch could be anything that is trying to access you know, some data. You also have an authorization server that is used to give you tokens and to validate that you have access or not. You have your resource server, which is your API that you're trying to access. And you have a resource owner, which is typically the end user. OAuth uses a set of permissions called scopes. So the scopes are usually displayed in the constant UI when you're trying to access a resource. There's no real standard on how the scope should be defined, apart from the fact that they should be separated by a space. So the authorization server will give you a token that will have a set or a subset of the permissions that you have access to. With OAuth, you receive some tokens. So your authorization server will give you a token which could give you access or should give you access to a resource. So it controls your access to the API. Your access tokens are fairly short-lived, typically a few minutes up to a day but you'll have a refresh token available also. And with that refresh token, you can actually get a new access token to continue to access a resource. The refresh token could be revoked at any time by the server, which would uh, limit your capabilities of getting a new access token if needed. Tokens can take different forms. It could be WS Federated, SAML, or JWT, or whatever you want. It's not defined in the standard, but we will focus more on JWT and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next lesson. Modern applications typically use JSON web tokens to pass information around. So what exactly is a JSON web token? So it's basically just a JSON object that has three main components. So it has a header, a payload, and a signature. Now the header will describe the token. So it will say something like, 
this is the algorithm that I'm using for the signature, and this is the type of token that I am, uh, in this case, a JWT. It also have a payload, and the payload will have multiple properties. So it could have a SUB, which is the subscriber or the user ID. It could have the uh, expiry date. It could have the issued date. It could have the issuer as well. So there's a bunch of different properties that are defined in the standard, but it could also have just about any information about the user, like the name or uh, his role and so on. And finally, the signature is a way to ensure the integrity of our JSON web token. All of those components are base64 encoded. So you get something that looks a little bit like this. So you've got your three parts all encoded. Finally, you concatenate all of those three components with a dot between them. And this gives you a big string that you can easily pass around. So it can be used as a query parameter even in a, uh, in a get request. You can also use jwt.io to create or to view your web tokens. It's a very useful tool if you want to play around and see what's, what information is available in those. The first thing that we'll need to use Auth0 is, of course, an Auth0 account. So what we'll do is that we'll create an account, and I'll go through the process with you right here. So if you go to Auth0.com, you'll have a sign up button. And you can sign up with a multiple social uh, sign up. So I'll use my Gmail account to create one. And there it is. So I can now create my first tenant. So a tenant is basically a, a domain or your own authorization server. So in this case, I'll use, uh, let's try Joel Lord. No, it's taken. Let's try Joel one. There you go. All right, then you can select the region. So I'll keep it at US, even if I'm in Canada. And let's just register for a personal developer account and just playing around. Now, Auth0 offers a free tier, which is pretty generous. So they, you can have about 7,000 users uh, before they actually start to charge you. So now we have your, our dashboard. And in here, we'll be able to see every people or every login that is done into our application. There are many things and many, many options available to you. Um, so very quickly, we can start creating clients. And in this case, we'll use a React application. And we'll choose a single page application. And you can see that there is already a tutorial that is available to you. So if you want, you can follow that. Or you know you can just follow my, my course here. So we'll use React as our client. Um, and like I said, there's many options that are available. You can specify different rules. So you can decide um, if you want to um, only have a whitelist, or if you want to add multi-factor authentication. So there's a lot of things that are available to you, and everything is built in. Now we will go back to our client here, and we will start to configure our client. We will need those information later on, so it's nice to know where they are. So they're in their client and under the client that you've just created. The one thing that we'll add right now is your callback URLs. So we will need a callback URL later on, and those need to be validated first. So we, we know that we will have a local host 3000 application and we'll have a callback route. So we can already allow that callback route. And that's about all we need for the configuration for now. So let's just save those changes and we should be good to go. Before we start developing our application, let's take a quick look at what we're going to build. So we're going to build a React application using the command line tool, create React app. And this is what we're going to end with. So we'll have this application that will have two different routes. So the first one will be set secret for the secret area. And if the user is not logged in, he won't be able to see anything. Now, if we go back to our main page, there will be a login button right here, which we can use and we will be redirected to Auth0. From there, we can log in. And once logged in, we are redirected automatically to the secret area. We can click on Home to go back to Home. Notice that the login button is not there anymore. And we can go back and forth from the secret area to the home page. 
there is also a logout button that is there for us so that we can log out of the application. By clicking there, we're redirected to the home page again. And if we try to go to the secret area, we cannot access that page once again. So that's it. Our first step is to create our application. So we'll start by using a command line tool to build all the scaffolding that we need for our application. So we'll use create react app and we specify a folder in which we want the application to be installed. When it starts, NPM will download all the different libraries that we need for our project. This may take a few seconds, so let's just fast forward through all of the process. Now that everything is downloaded and ready to go, let's fire up our IDE. Now Create React App did a bunch of different things for us. It created a source folder in which you'll find an index.js file, which is the base bootstrap file, and it refers to app, which is a component that has the, the main screen or the home screen of our application. Let's now fire up a terminal window. And from this terminal, we'll be able to run npm start, which will start our server as well as open up our browser, and it will show us our application. Create React App installs all the libraries that we need, as well as a basic application and all the tooling that we will use. So as you can see, if I go to my code and I change a little bit, so I'll add a user here, it compiles everything. And if I go back to my browser, the changes are reflected immediately. So no need to refresh, everything is built in for us. So the first thing we'll want to do is to create some sort of state management. To do this, we'll head over to our index.js file. From here, we'll create a global variable that will contain the state of our application. We'll also create a setState function, which is a global function. And this function will track all of the changes in the state of our application. So anytime that we want to change anything, we'll use that function to actually do the changes and also to re-render our application. So we'll use an object.assign so that we don't mutate the actual state. We'll use an empty object, we'll put in state, and we'll apply all the changes onto it. And we'll simply copy and paste this React DOM render function. And now we have our state management function. So every time that a change occurs in the application, we should always run this function and all the changes will be applied on the state and everything should be re-rendered correctly. We can then define the initial state of our application. So let's just store that into a variable and we'll pass it a name property, which will just contain my name. And that will be the state of the application. So let's just start the application by using the set state function that we've just coded and we'll pass in the initial state. This will take care of calling the render function when the application actually starts. So now let's take a quick look at the application so that we can see right now that nothing changed. So, so far, so good, no errors. And we'll use the property right here in our app. So we'll pass in all the properties of our state to our application by using the spread operator. And in our app component, we'll go and we'll just change the user here and we'll use our property, this props name, which contains the name that we've defined in the state of our application. So now if we go there, we can see that the name was actually applied. So our state engine is actually working. Now we don't necessarily want app to contain all of the logic of our application. So we'll also create a new component. We'll create a folder called components and we'll create a main component, which will contain the main view. We'll call it main. And from here, we'll create a react component, just like we uh, would do for any regular component. So we'll start by importing react and component from react. Sorry. Now we can do our export default class, which extends component. Now our class needs a render function, which will return. And this is all the components. So what we'll do is that we'll go in app, we'll take this little part here, and we'll just 
cut this and paste it over in our main application. Now we'll probably need to add more, so we'll just wrap everything inside of a div. We can now use our main component inside of our app. So we'll just go in here, add main, just self-closing, and we'll need to import it, of course. So import from components, main. Sorry, import main from components main. So now looking at our application, nothing changed. So that's always good, and nothing is broken, so we're on the right track. The next step would be to add a router. So we'll go into our index and we'll add a very quick and dirty routing system. So we'll just add a new property to our state, which is location. And it will use location.pathName. We'll also make sure to remove the uh, front slash and trailing slash with this regular expression. Perfect. Okay, so now we have our location path name. Now that we have this inside of our state, we can go back to our application. And in here, we can use our location property to change what is displayed on the page. So we'll start by creating a variable that will contain the main component that is displayed on this page. Now we'll do a switch case with the location property. And if it's nothing, we'll just display the main component, which is the main page or the home page. Don't forget to break. Let's also create another case for our secret route. This is the one that will eventually be protected by authorization. And the main component for this one will be secret. And let's just add a default, which will be main. Now, instead of displaying main, what we'll do is that we'll use the main component here. So based on the location, it will define the main component, and this is what is going to be displayed in our page. Let's save this and take a look at our application. Oh, we've got an error. So it failed to compile, uh, but that's because secret is not defined yet. So we still have to build our component and then import it. So we'll do a new file, we'll create a secret. And we'll just build a component just the way we did for main here. So we'll do an import, React and component from React. And then we'll do our export default class, secret extends component. And it will contain, of course, a render function, which will return. And we'll just create a div. And we'll just say that it's a secret area. So now we can go back to our app. And we can import this, this new component. And this should fix our error. So let's save. And we still have an error there. Um, so I completely forgot about it earlier, but our linter will not let us use restricted global. So if we go to our index, we can override this. And we'll just do a, a comment here to override the no restricted globals. That should fix our error. So there you have it. Now, if we go and take a look at our application, it's still the same, but I can actually change the route and go to the secret area or go back to our home page. Now, I have used the main component when there's we can't find a matching route, but I don't really like that. So we'll have to use a not found or page not found um, instead. So we'll create a new component. We'll go into JavaScript file and we'll create a new component named not found. 
Now in here, we'll just do our typical import React component from React. And we'll create our class. And in here, we'll render. And we'll just do a div and say page not found. Now going back to our main app, we'll import this. And we'll change our default route to display not found. Let's save this and we can now try it in our browser. So if we go in and we change our route to whatever, okay, page not found, so that's good. Secret is still working. And if we remove that, we're back to our home page. So far, so good. Now, when we created our Auth0 account, we specified a callback route. So this is the route that will be used by Auth0 to, to redirect the users. So we'll need to create a new route for this. So we'll just create a new component here and we'll call it callback. And we'll just do as any other default, uh, any other components. So import react component from react. And then we'll just export a class. And we'll do our render function and it will simply have a div return div and it will just have loading. So now we'll go back to app and we'll define this as a new route. And we'll just do callback here. And it gets imported automatically by WebStorm, so that's good. And let's not forget our break. And we're good. Let's run this in our browser, make sure that we haven't broken anything. So callback is good. And let's just test my other routes. So secret, still good. And nothing leads me to my homepage. So all of our routes are work working. Now we'll just make sure that we can also pass all of our properties to some of our components or the properties that they need. So in this case, we'll just uh, pass in the uh, property, all of our properties to main. And in main, in our main component, we'll just add the name of the user here. So we'll say hello props.name. And let's test this in the browser. So we can see hello Joel, so that's good. So our data is propagated through our components. So let's just change the name here to uh, Johnny. Now, if we look at our browser, it says welcome Johnny, hello Johnny. So all of our data is propagated, so everything seems to be working. So we have our basic application, pretty much everything is in place now. The only thing that we'll need to do, of course, is to add authorization or authentication to this app so that we can hide secret behind a protected route. So this is what we'll be doing in the next lessons. Now, the first thing that we'll need to do is to install our NPM package required for authentication. So we'll start to go in our terminal and we'll do an NPM install. And we'll do dash dash save so that it saves it into our package JSON file. And we'll add auth0 dash js. So this takes care of installing the required packages, and that's all we'll need for our project. Now that the package is installed, we can run npm start. And this should restart our project, and it should load, and there we have it. First of all, let's add a link to our secret area. So we'll just go into our, uh, not the secret, but in our main component, and we'll change the hello Johnny, and we'll just add a clickbait headline here.
and we'll do a, a link, just a regular href to our slash secret URI. And there you go. So if we save this, we have the link there and it redirects to the right page so we can go back. So that looks good. Now we'll want to put everything related to authentication in its own file. So we'll, we'll create a new class in here and everything with odd zero will be stored in there. So let's go into our source folder and create a new file, which will be named auth. And we can get started with our authentication. So let's start by importing our, importing our odd zero library. And we can now create a new class. So this class is just a regular class, which will be called auth. And it will create, it will contain an odd zero property. And we'll use odd zero dot web auth to initialize this object. Now the odd zero library from NPM is simply a wrapper around all the auth zero APIs. It will provide us with some methods that we can use to log in or to uh, make sure that the user is authenticated or not. So let's start by initializing this object with some default properties that can be found on the odd zero web page. So let's log in so that we can see our dashboard. And in here we have a list of clients and React is the one that we created for this application. So as you can see, there's a bunch of different properties here and we'll use those for authentication. So we'll start by creating our first property, which is the domain, which is basically our authentication server on odd zero. We also need a client ID, which can be found here. And we'll just paste this in. And we'll need a redirect URI. So this is where the users will be redirected after the authentication is done. We won't need the client secret for now because it's only used for servers. So we'll just make sure that our callback URI is defined right here. We'll just add an HTTP in front of it. And we'll copy this right here. Now we can also add a few properties. So we'll add an audience. The audience is an endpoint to get some user information. So we'll use our domain. And we'll use the slash user info endpoint. We'll also need a response type. And the response type will be a token as well as an identity token. So we'll use both. Uh, for now, we'll only focus on the token, but we'll use the identity token later on. And we'll also specify a scope, which is what will be passed in our identity token. So right now, we'll just tell to use open ID. Now we won't need odd zero anymore, so we can close this window and come back to our development environment. So just fix this, perfect. Now we'll, we can add a few methods to our class. So let's start by adding a constructor and we'll get back to it and we'll add a login method. So login will simply use odd zero and just call the authorize method in it. So this will take care of redirecting our users to a login page. Now we'll go to our constructor and just make sure that this new method is binded to the right context. So we'll just do a, a login bind this. This will let us use the odd zero property inside of our method there. So now let's go back to our index page and we can actually call this class. So we'll make sure that we import it. and we can define it for later use. Now we'll add this new auth variable into our state. By doing so, we'll be able to access the auth object in any of our components, or at least in the app component, which then passes it over to the main component. So if we go to our main, we now have access to this. So we can add a section for the login. So we'll start by adding a div. We'll just make it fancy with an HR. We'll add a little bit of text, so please log in. We'll just add a new button here, and it'll say login. So if we save, 
we have our login button, but it doesn't do anything for now. But we have our auth object, so we can actually use that property, and it's already propagated for us. So we'll just do an on click. This props .auth login. So it will call the login method of our new created class. So if we try it now and we click on the login, we are now redirected to odd zero to the login screen. So everything is there for us. Now we'll log in. So I'll just use my Gmail credentials. I will authorize the this application to access my information. And we're redirected to the callback. So it says loading, but it's actually just a static text. So we're redirected to callback, and you'll notice that we have access to a bunch of properties in here. So we have our access token, we have token type, bearer, and so on. And there's a lot of stuff there. And our next step will be to actually process all of that information to validate if the user was authenticated or not. So we now have a, an application that enables you to log in and it redirects you to a callback page after it's logged in and gives you a bunch of different information. So what we'll try to do now is to parse that information and actually validate if the user is authenticated or not. So to do that, we'll go back to our code. We'll go to the odd class and we'll add a few methods in here. So first we'll add a handle authentication method. We'll also add a is authenticated method, which will return true if the user is actually authenticated. Handle authentication will take all the information in that query that we got and we'll parse that data using the odd zero library. So we'll use parse hash and it takes a callback with error and auth results. Now we can take a look at the auth results and check if we have the auth results object for starters. Then we can take a look if there's an access token. And we'll also look if there's if there's an ID token. So as part of the arguments that we get from odd zero, we have an expires in variable that we can use. Now we'll need to convert that into an actual timestamp so that we can verify if the user is still authenticated or if his token is expired. We can now store the access token that we have in our local storage. We will also store the ID token. And finally, we'll store the expires at value with our newly created timestamp. Let's also make sure that we remove all of that information from our query string. So we'll just remove the hash part and we'll redirect our user to a page that is defined for on success. I like to use constants for those, so I'll just define a login success page. And I'll go and define my constant right at the top. And once a user is logged in, we'll send him to, and uh, let's, let's send him to the secret page. Okay, so that's for our success path. Now on failure, we can check if there's an error. And if that's the case, we will redirect our user to a login failure page. And we'll console log the error. Now we'll define the login failure page to be the home page. Now for our is authenticated method, we'll simply use our expires at value that we've stored in our local storage.
and we'll check if that value is greater than the current timestamp. Now we can save our file. So we can see that we have a fail to compile message. So that's because we're using a restricted global again. So once again, we'll go and override our linter. So we'll just go on top, add an ESLint no restricted global zero, and save that again, and our errors should disappear. We now have everything that we need to verify if the user is authenticated or not. So let's go to our main page, or to our router actually in app, and we can secure this route by validating if the user is authenticated or not. So we'll use our is authenticated method here. And if it's authenticated, then we'll display the secret page. And if not, we'll display the not found page. Now that the handle authentication method is defined, let's use it in our callback component. To do this, we'll add a component did mount method to our class. In here, we'll call our auth class. And we'll tell it to handle the authentication. Let's not forget to import it. We should now be good to go, so why don't we take it for a test run? So let's go to our browser, and we have our home page here. So if we try to go to the secret area, we see that we have a not found page. That's because we're not authenticated yet. So let's use our login button. We get our odd zero login form, and we can log in with Google. So I'll just use my Gmail here, and I am redirected to the super secret area. So now if I go back to home, and back here, you can see that I'm always seeing the secret area here. Now, just for fun, let's take a quick look at our local storage here. So we have got our local storage. And in here, you can see that we have an access token. So why don't we remove that? We have an expires app. We'll just replace that by an empty object. And now that we've removed everything, what do we have? So let's refresh this page. And we have a, uh-oh, not found page again. So that's because when we don't have everything in our local storage, our application assumes that we're not authenticated. So we would have to log in again. Now that we have the means to know if our user is authenticated, we can go and tweak our UI a little bit. So let's go in main, and let's only display the login button if the user is authenticated. So we'll use the property, this.props.auth, and we'll see if is authenticated. So if the user is not authenticated, then we can display this part. That's it. Now if we go back to our browser and back to our login page, we see that the button is there. So let's just quickly log in, let's remove this. We have a super secret area, but if we go back to our homepage, we see that the login button is not there anymore. So the only thing that we have left to do really is to find a way to be able to log out the users. So that's what we'll tackle on in the next lesson. So we pretty much have everything that we need for our user to log in and to protect some of the routes from unauthorized users. So now that we have all of this, the only thing that we're missing really is a way for the user to log out. Logging out is fairly easy. Basically, you just have to forget about the token that you had. To do this, we'll go into our off class and we'll add a logout method. Now and there, we'll try to remove all of the data that we've stored in the local storage. So it's simply a matter of doing a local storage, remove item, and we'll remove the access token. We'll also remove the ID token. And finally, we'll remove the expires at entry that we had.
And finally, we'll redirect our user to the login failure page, uh, which is the home page. And that's all we need, really. So now we'll need to add a logout button to our application. So let's go into our secret area. And we'll just add a new line. And we'll create a new button. Now, in order for the button to be able to access the logout method, it will need to be propagated from the main application all the way to the secret. So let's go in app and add the state to the secret component. So now if we go back to our secret, we can access the auth property and use it with the onClick method. So let's take a look at that in our browser to see if it works. So we've got our login page. So let's just click on login. We log in with Google. And there we have it. So we have a super secret area. We can go to home and we can go back from back and forth and we can log out. And once we're logged out, if we go to the secret area, page is not found. So it works. So our authentication is set up now. So we can protect certain routes behind a login page. But let's see if we can take this one step further. So I talked about ID tokens earlier. So what are, what are they exactly? Well, if you take a quick look at our application, we have an ID token here. So it's a big string that is passed around. And it's a JSON web token. So if you go to jwt.io, it kind of gives you examples of how JSON web tokens work. So they have a header which specifies the type of JSON web token. And most importantly, in our case, they have a payload. And the payload will contain information about the user ID as well as when this token was issued and so on. The last part is a signature and is there to verify the integrity of the token itself. So if we go back to our code, and in here we, had, we add profile to our scope. Let's just go back to the application. We can log out, log back in. I'll still log in with my Google account. Now, if I take a look at this ID token here, I can paste it in jwt.io to see what is the content of it. And you can see that it has my given name, family name, nickname and a bunch of different information about myself. So it's all my profile information available that was shared through the application. So maybe we can use that. So let's take a look at how we would approach this. So the first thing we'll need to do is to install a new library. It's called JWT Decode. Now we can restart our application. And then in our auth class, I'll add a new method here. Now to that method, we will check if there's a ID token available. And if it's available, then we will return the JWT decoded. So we'll just need to use our library that we've installed earlier. So we'll do import JWT decode from JWT decode. And then we can use this and decode the token that we have in our local storage. So this is what we will return. Now, if we don't have a token, let's just return an empty object. Perfect. We can now go back to our index page. And now we'll try to use this uh, new username that we have. So we'll try to get the username from the profile. And we'll get given name. And if it's not available, we'll still use Johnny. Now let's just change this in our initial state. And let's give it a try.
So if you navigate to home, you can see that the name is changed to Joel. So it picked up my profile information, and this is what is being displayed right now. So if I go back to the secret area, I can log out. And as you can see, it's back to Johnny because there's no profile information available for the user anymore. So there you have it. You can now access the profile information from Google for your users. Congratulations, you have completed all the lessons in this course. You can now secure your React applications using Auth0. In the context of larger applications, you will need to integrate it into a React router, of course, but the concepts remain pretty much the same. Now, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me, and thank you for listening.